set of things of which reachable elements, reachable by R elements of the domain, uh, corresponds to the uh, appropriate property. And then we go to something which we touch a lot of time, but not, not uh, in much detail. So, we can look expressions, but uh, now we need to organize our knowledge somehow. And the knowledge is organized in uh, the T-box and A-box. And the T-box is a uh, roughly general knowledge of the, of the domain area, if, if uh, we would speak from, from the outside. So it contains a T box with a finite set of uh, general, inclusion, uh, general concept of conclusions, or just substantial axioms, or uh, this uh, axioms in the form uh, C subsumed by D. E. Uh, here C and D are concept expressions, so it might be uh, named concepts, one of them might be named one, it might be complex one. And there are worst cases when both of them complex ones. Uh, and uh, the semantics is simple. So uh, the model of interpretation I satisfies uh, C subsumed by D or C implies D. It's also possible to say if C uh, interpretation of C is a subset of interpretation of D, which is quite obvious. Our uh, general uh, model theory is minus. And it's written as this uh, so this sign. So C implies D, but not, not the general, uh, but by, by, by means of uh, interpretation I. And uh, we say that I is a model of interpretation I is a model of T box when it satisfies every axiom in this T box. Uh, what does it mean? It means that okay, we have some fixed some definitions of the concepts in our T box, in our system of axioms and, and draws. And then we check if all of the axioms which can be used are straight to the model. If all of them are satisfied, we will step to the interpretation. And if it's so, then we've got a model which uh, guarantees that. Uh, Every, every restriction in the, the T-box or every stuff relation. What here is, is um, holds for this model, for, for this implementation. So in this case, implementation is called model. And uh, <coughs> as I did before, if I have two subsumptions between the couple of terms, then we, the, these terms are equivalent. And we would use this uh, sign C equivalent to D to denote this. Right. Okay, so uh, small example. Uh, father is exactly a man uh, who has uh, some human child. Uh, it's it's uh, equivalent, so we have two implications here. First, if we see a father, we can infer that it's a man and it has some, some uh, child who is human. Excuse me? Yeah? It's uh, very hard to see uh, what is in the bottom of the slide. So if you have your presentation on a flashback, uh, yeah. you have to look a little bit. Uh, right. It's somewhere around. Uh, Yesterday, so yesterday the T boxes didn't allow uh, such a cycles. 
we put a lot of such a sequence. But now we have uh, that human cos, human composite of human, is defined in terms of human itself, and which will lead to problems, as, as we'll see, see soon. And um, this uh, real GCI, which doesn't even have uh, names on the top level, name classes, say if uh, something has a favorite movie, then this something should drink some beer, which uh, might be uh, might not correspond exactly to our knowledge of the world. It might just be I don't know an owner of brewery, so we couldn't drink beer, just just whiskey. But um, uh, this is a piece of knowledge which is uh, set in our model. Right, any questions up to now? Okay. Well, it was just a revelation of the Right, so if there are no questions, let's try to test something, check whether, how we understand this. Okay, uh, let's try to check whether this assumption holds. Right, any, any, you how to do so? this? And, well, first of all, any idea whether it's false or not? Whether it's true that uh, a concept exists R A or B is uh, subsumed by a concept exists R A. In a little how we check in this, this sort of things? Right, so what, what does it mean that uh, something is some, some, some concept of something, something is something? It's more more. Right, so this, this means that we need to check whether uh, for all interpretations, interpretation of what exists are uh, A and B. It is sub class, uh, not sub class, sorry, subset of interpretation of.
what was the purpose of this expression? How it look? And no one could, who knows how that should look like, but it was it an exercise from yesterday. So. Oh, okay. Right, so everybody already did it. Well, not a lot to bother anymore. Well, that doesn't mean they, they've done the exercise. Ah. So it's sort of like a homework check. Yes. Right? Okay. Right. So, again, if you look at the structure, the top level thing is an extension. Right? And if we remember what this extension means, that we have again yeah, not some not X prime on the model, which have an arrange to another node in the model should go wide prime. But it's a different model. So uh, what what can we say about X and Y? Besides that they are related to each other like R. Anything? Right. Y prime is in the A class. So, and that's actually all we can tell out of this. Things, right? So, if you look at these two models, what can we tell about them? Right. Uh, seems like this model is a bit, this, this one is a bit more restrictive, right? While we would not have to say anything about B or conjunction with B or A, anything else in the green model, right? That's what's good. So, this model allows us to have, let's say, not B here, and it will be better defined, still a model of this expression. But this model doesn't allow us to do so. But this model says exactly the same thing about A as this one and R. So they agree on A, they agree on R, but this is more restrictive. So every model of the first thing is also a model of the second thing. Right? Which means uh, that essentially that this subsumption holds. Because as we look at it, up, right? The interpretation of C is sub set of interpretation of D. So every model for 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 C, which is this expression, is also a model of D, which is this expression, right? So at least they have the same amount of models. But this definitely has more because we can show one. Of them. Which is not the one we'll uh, this one. So, uh, yeah, this is something called. Right. Any, any more examples? Something to do. Any questions on how we work this result? Uh, one of these, uh, the next three things, and let's, let's try to check whether it's a tough one. Which, which one shall we choose? Well, it's probably wants to choose one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's good that it's not two. Number three. Yeah. Okay. Right. Number three. It's uh, so, Right, so 
staat voor God dan ook?
Right. Okay. Someone else? This one? And the last one? Or we'll just go on? Probably we'll just go on. But we'll do it again. We'll have a chance. Okay, now uh, let's move a little bit on and introduce the A-box. So the T-box, as we saw it before, it captures the knowledge um, on a conceptual level. So what we manipulate with sets and relations between sets. Uh, like, we speak about all humans, all, I don't know, dogs, uh, managers, projects, and all that, in, in general. So, and it defines concepts and makes some statements about these concepts. And the a -box is going in a more details about elements of the domain, of individuals. So capture knowledge on the individual level. If we, we don't speak about humans at this level, we speak about particular people like Boris and Dmitri, uh, other and another Dmitri. Two Dmitris are different, while well, they have the same name, first name, and so on. So it's um, a box is a final set of functions which are either concepts or all assertions. And concept, uh, concept assertions are a name of individual uh, corresponding to and then class name and then concept to which it corresponds. Like John is a man. He a man is a concept from a T box, and John is a individual name. So it's a named choose named name. And role assertions are two individuals related via some uh, role. Like John and Mary is a pair corresponding to a has child relation, which means semantically that actually John has a child who is married. Mary is a child of John. And the formal semantics is uh, again as follows. So every individual name is mapped to some element of the domain. So it's not a set anymore, it's a single point in our domain. And uh, so we extend our interpretation to deal not with just concept uh, and concept expressions and roles, but also with individuals. And uh, interpretation satisfies the concept assertion if this element corresponding to a name given to it, to a name A, is uh, part of the set which corresponds to interpretation of the class C. Uh, interpretations. And uh, okay, interpretations satisfies the role assertion in a similar way. If, if the pair of two individuals is in the interpretation of a role, corresponding role. And uh, again, as before, as in the case of T box, interpretation is a model of an A box if it uh, satisfies every assertion, every absolute of the A box. And we we'll say, uh, that some uh, uh, constant assertion is entailed by A. Uh, if, if every model of A, so every interpretation which satisfies all the uh, axioms in A, also satisfies the individual assertion. Right, is it, is it clear? Do you have any questions? So, right, let's, let's go with the end of the exam. Okay, so we have uh, we have no T box now. We don't, don't have any restrictions on the classes of properties we've got. So we have just a plain A box, right? We see that A is an instance of, uh, yeah, for the concept assertion, we will say that. For the concept assertion, A, C, we say A is an instance of C. This is like this. So A is an instance of B and this is C. B is an instance of this complex, uh, 
complex conjunction, and P and A are related via properties, via process. Right? Okay, so what can we say about today? Does it come up? Any ideas? But as, as we're facing this problem, let's try to do them all. What's the next? So we do have at least two elements in our memory, right? Because we named them. But it's not exactly true, because we did never say that A and B are different. Right? They, they might map to, to the same element. But let's, let's okay, we, we try to find M model. Right, so everything is possible. Let's say they are different. So we have A here and B here. So what do we know about the potential models? What, what are the restrictions? We know that B and A are by the last axiom, by the global assertion. We know that B and A are connected by S. Right. What else? From the concept assertions, what do we know? <laughs> right. We know that uh, A is instance of uh, B and C assertions, right? So every model, in every model, A should be in a set that corresponds to B, interpretation of B and F is us. So here we have B and this R C somewhere, and this means that we have B here, and this R C due to, due to their properties of conjunction. And this latest one means that we do have some other existential x or x which is connected to a by r and we'll see here <coughs> right we could do the same for me right i'll do it quite quickly
Right, so to answer this question, does it have a model? Yes. Because we can just find one. Okay, uh, right. Describe some of them. We sort of we, we build ones then, right? We, we can describe describe this one. Uh, I'll describe a lot from it. A lot from every B is a, an element of A and not P. Uh, but every A, interpretation of A should be an element of B and should have R connection to some point in which which is an element of C and at the same time. And that's, um, let's say that it covers most of the restrictions. So, it's not in every model that has just these properties. Uh, no, not every interpretation which has just these properties that I just described is a model. Because if we add something like some node y, which has connection to some node z, in which we have node f, then this wouldn't be a model, right? Why? You can tell why it's not a model for, for our tables. Right. So let's let's 
go further and combine two things together. So, if I have a T-box that captures a uh, uh, general knowledge on a concept level, and we have an A-box which captures uh, knowledge about individuals and combine its express this knowledge about individuals in terms of the knowledge that describes the T-box. Then these two things together we would call ontology. And uh, notations is either T comma A in brackets or just a union of the two because the axioms are really different and we couldn't mix them. So yeah, we would use the first one in the top one. If you see the second it's the same thing. Right, and semantics is obvious, okay, so the interpretation is a model of the ontology if uh, it's uh, a model of T-box and a model of A-box, or in other words, uh, it satisfies every axiom and assertion in the ontology. Right, and now a couple of uh, new definitions and definitions. So, the ontology is called consistent, if it have a model. So, if there is any, any model of uh, uh, an ontology, if you can find an interpretation that uh, satisfies all the facts of the ontology, then the ontology is consistent. Ontology is called coherent if uh, every concept name that appears in the signature of the ontology, every concept name which you see in an axiom or in class assertion, is satisfied so with respect to this ontology. So we have a, if uh, we take a model of the ontology, then this mod in this model, the interpretation of a given concept is non empty. And uh, again, this assumption is entailed by ontology. Uh, uh, it's entailed by every model of the ontology, and uh, class assertion is entailed by ontology. It's entailed by uh, every model of the ontology. So that's the same. But now, um, okay, we, we why do we need reasoning? We need reasoning to actually decide whether our ontology um, have some of these features. So let's look at this more precisely. Right, how are we going to assume we have an ontology, right? Which is two box and a box. Uh, so how are we going to check, well, it's not how. One of the main problems is whether all is consistent. So before we start doing anything, ask any questions, about our ontology. We need to uh, figure out whether this ontology has a model at all or not. And the formal check for this is right, uh, to check whether ontology entails assumption between top and bottom. Because if top is a subclass of bottom, this means that our domain is empty, which is, uh, if you would have a model, then this domain would be empty, which is not possible. So, uh, right, this is how we, what, what semantic remains the consistency of ontology. Uh, right, coherence. Coherence is reduced, can be reduced to check this satisfactory in a single uh, name class. And so, the concept is satisfiable if we couldn't uh, entail that this concept is a subclass of uh, is, is a subsumed by bottom. Right, the concept of subsumption is, is simple. Let's check this. And the business uh, checking is also simple. You have to check to entail that B is an instance B. The problem is to check whether for you will be and uh, concept name B capital, whether ontology entails that B is and uh, that 
Dolgen Dev said, cost session we said, things and so on. Right, and for ILC, the following theorem uh, holds. So, let, for, for every ontology, these tasks are equivalent to each other. So, we might reduce all the tasks to the consistency check. So, let's take the ontology and take the individual which is not in the A box of the ontology, which is new to it. To it. Then, how we might check the sensibility of the concept? Right, okay, we try to put this concept uh, add to the ontology uh, concept assertion A is an instance of C for this new field A and check whether it's consistent. Because if it's not consistent, then uh, this assertion makes an ontology bad. And this means that for the integration of C should be empty, which would be due consistency. So if the ontology is consistent, then there is a model for C. And for, by, by the semantics, the A should be an uh, element of, of this model. So C is satisfied by, by the definition. Right, this assumption is false if uh, by adding this construction to the ontology makes uh, this, this constant assertion, makes the ontology inconsistent. Um, right, what does it mean? Let's say, okay, we try to see if we can find an element in the ontology which is part of A and part of, uh, and at the same time is not part of B. And if we couldn't find such an ontology, this means that every element which is in A should also be in B, in B because we took a random element of the domain which is not constrained in any way in our ontology. If you found such an element, which would, it would be a witness, a counterexample to that statement. So it would say, okay, yeah, that's fine. Have A here and not B at the same time. So A is, at least this, in this element, a, a would be outside of B. So this assumption would be called. And similar, similar for the last one. So if we, oops, oh no, that's fine. So we take an individual B and try to add not B there and see whether the ontology is consistent or not. And if it is inconsistent, then this means that this happens because of B and not B are, are um, B small is an instance of uh, both B and non-B at the same time, which is which means uh, an instance of L and T also. So yeah, in, in all these cases I need to note that the ontology O at the beginning should be consistent. Because if, if it is inconsistent, all other things just uh, there is no sense to check anything else. Right. So, now we need to solve, if you want to solve this problem, it's enough to solve only a problem of consistency and ontology. Right, so let's, let's define such an So, if you remember, Boris just this talk about the table which decides the satisfiability of the model. Right? We decide this uh, consistency of terms of ontology instead. It's all, they're just not stack over to each other, but it's just different variation. So, again, yeah, we have an ontology, we have a, we know that everything in the ontology is in this, written in the description of the KLC with conjunctions, conjunctions, and all constructions. And we need to design an algorithm to decide the consistency of the ontology. Right. And, okay, if you remember from yesterday's talk, we try to construct a model. Interpretation for, for ontology. Right. 
If if um, algorithm is successful, then ontology is consistent because we can just show the model here it is. And uh, okay, it's it's in our simple case. If the logic would be more complex, then we couldn't build a model and so on. Well, actually, even for this case, we couldn't. Not always can build a model. So we can present description of a model by which this model could be constructed. I'll, I'll go back to this later. And this, uh, historically, this representation, finite representation of a model is called tableau. That's why tableau. Right. But if not successful, if we couldn't uh, build a model by our algorithm, then we can prove that there is no model for that topology. So it didn't exist. Right, and uh, uh, okay, the algorithm will work on a set of A boxes. Right, you start with a single uh, A box, which is an A box of our initial ontology. And then uh, we are going to extend this A boxes in the set by a set of rules. Uh, in order to make the constraint of the tire axons explicit. So just like we are doing here. Right, so we see complex expression here, and in order to this slide, we do some actions. We somehow manipulate the model to, to ensure that everything is uh, in place, every, every constraint is satisfied. So the same thing we're going to do here more formally, more um, structured way. And uh, again, in the end, the ontology is consistent if in this set of A boxes we built in there. Uh, the ontology T and A box and A prime is consistent. So we take a set of axioms starting from an initial A box. Then we enrich it with the additional constraints using rules, specific rules, and then in the end we have a set of A boxes, and if one of them is consistent with respect to a T box we've got here, then the initial ontology is consistent. Right, okay, I'll skip this because we already know this from yesterday. So yeah, the initial normal form is only only need to simplify explanation. Don't need it uh, in reality for the table algorithms and it's actually bad. But for, for the ease of uh, explanation for the simplistic rules, we, we use this notation. And another thing that we need to know now is okay, every, every concept uh, in the, uh, that we'll see in our description assumed to be a negative normal form. And if we need to construct negative normal form, if we need to negate some, some complex concept expression, if we just put negation in front of it, we will break the negation normal form, right? So we use this sign, uh, not with a dot on it, to, to know that, okay, we negate this and immediately transform this expression into negative normal form in order to apply, to, to let our rules apply. Right, is it, is it defined and clear? Okay. Right, I think now it's up to rules. Well, not yet. Right, so the, the structure of algorithm in a bit more details. As, as I said, it's works on a set of A boxes, starting from a single A box from the ontology. And Applying the rules uh, to to some of the A boxes and application of rule to A box replace it with one or two other A boxes and um, we apply rules uh, until the uh, until it's possible to apply any rule to any A box. We stop when there are no more rules applicable to any A box at all. And if, if we reach this stage and we have a 
uh, clash free ABOX. So ABOX for which we don't have uh, A instances of A, A and A instances of not A uh, concept assertions uh, at the same time. So And if we finish and we find a, a clash free A box, then we say, okay, all is consistent. Because we take this A box and we take the original T box and we sort of have a model. But we can accept the model for the ontology. Right, and here are the set of rules, which are, well, very similar to what we got yesterday. Then different notations, so I'll go for the distinction rule, for example. Rule. Right, so if uh, there is one of the A box in our set and uh, uh, an individual A which is labeled by exists as exists as C, then and um, there is no B. No individual being in our A box, in the chosen, chosen A box, such that uh, business of C at the same time A and B are connected via S. <laughs> then we create a new individual name C and which is, which is fresh for A, which didn't appear in A before. And uh, right, we replace A with A and this new elements here. So A and C now are in relation to S, and C is S of C. Right. So as, as before, as, as, as you remember from yesterday, hopefully uh, there are four rules, one rule on each of the constructor in the, uh, in the ontology, uh, in, the, in the logic LC. And um, we don't uh, and an extra rule which hadn't before. And this rule is necessary because we now have a T box, general T box with general absence in it. And we need to take this into account. Because uh, yesterday we do to this ability and all, all the T boxes were and fold it into a single concept expression uh, that then we can ignore, it's just ignore T-box. Here we couldn't ignore T-box, and so the rule is, if we have a uh, general concept inclusion accent C implies D in our T-box, and we don't have such a disjunction in uh, any individual in the A-box, then we just added this, this expression to the A box. So, what does it really mean? It says, okay, we have to ensure that, well, every model of, uh, of our ontology should be here. What does the not This dot. Uh, it means that, uh, okay, this, uh, this actually is not C, but not C on its own is not in the negative normal form. So this dot means that we create a negation of the function, and then we immediately transform it into a negative normal form. Mm -hmm. Because all our rules assume that the top level connector connection is something like uh, dot, and or existential universal. But we're not expecting knots to be there. So all, all the knots should be propagated down to the uh, main concepts. So this means that we create an expression which is suitable for our rules to apply. We don't break the application of rules. For all rules. Hmm? And this is for all rules. Uh, well, for all, uh, all other things are already in negative number four. So we're, we're fine with this. And we don't need to do anything with named uh, concepts or negative named concepts. 
because we use them only to detect clashes. But in this case, we have arbitrary expression, which we, if we put negation in front of it, then none of the rules will be applicable, right? We expect to see something else from negation. And for, for the simplicity of the algorithm, we just push, push these negations through, through all the expression. Right. So, uh, where we are? Uh, right? So every model should satisfy this uh, this implication, right? So this uh, in every point of, of our model, this implication should should, should hold. It. And this means that um, okay, what does it mean that C implies D? This is, is true for, for, for a particular element of our domain. This means that, uh, okay, either it's turn it over. Oh, uh, yeah. Right. Or, or this, right? Every decide to be a the full top of life. Hmm? Would it help if you just explain that every decide to be a reason with the full top of life? Yeah, I think so. No, I don't have it. But it's easy to Okay, yeah. Yeah, let's put this way. So uh Uh, ontology uh, implies, um, so this implies C uh, is a sub concept of D. D. This assumes C is equivalent to actually right. So top implies not C or D. And it's, it's, it's quite quite easy to see. So if we need to prove that every model of C is a model of D, right? Okay, so if we take a single point, if it's in the C, then it should be in D as well. So this is this one. And if it's not in C, we're fine. We don't care about D at all. So this is this one. And as long as these two things are equivalent, we need, just need to make sure that every every instance of top concept is also an instance of this thing. And this is exactly what you can hear. So is it is it clear? Or you feel better now? Right. So observations. So we, we apply rules if if the application adds something new to the to our model. And the only rule which increases the size of our set yes, is the disjunction rule. Because on every application of disjunction we replace our A box with two of them. One for the first alternative and one for the second for the reasons that Paul has explained before. But he chose not deterministically one of them. And I just, I, I, I don't want to choose. I just put both of them together and hope that, well, and see whether one of them would be clash <coughs> Right. So what's next? Right. She said, it's really bad. Because for every individual, for every A box, it adds a disjunction to the thing, which blows up the, uh, the size of the S, because this disjunction leads to, uh, produces more and more A boxes. And uh, actually, if you think a little bit about it, it's just look at 
four, four just eyes and four well, the left hand side is just a concept name. Because as we did with unfolding before uh, yesterday, uh, we could actually, if we see the uh, concept name of the left hand side of the GCI, we could just unfold it on the fly. Or lazily, it's called lazy <coughs> unfolding. So, and this is implemented in this uh, related GCI rule. So this is a concept name, and we have a GCI, or actually B is this subconcept of F, B implies F in our T-box, and um, B is an instance of A, and uh, F is not in A is an instance of B, but not in F. Now A box, then in this case we replace, we add this A is an instance of F to our A box. So what's good about this? Why is it better? Because we have an additional constraint here. So we say we only apply this rule if for uh, for the individuals of the A box, which contains this concept. Uh, assertion A is instance of B. And if we don't have this, we don't uh, apply this to salary at all. So we save quite a number of applications. Right, and another observation for the thing. If an apex is replaced with something, then it always grow. We never shrink things, we never throw away things from the A box. We all only add new assertions in the A box. Right. That's quite a challenging thing. I think that's the only thing we could manage to do before the break. So let's try to to apply the table of objects to this table. And, uh, so I'll, I'll do the following. So we have four individuals, three individuals, right? We have A, we have B, and then I'll put a yeah, comma separated list of concepts of which every individual is necessary. So I put a uh, roller assertion straight away just to not forget it. F A is an R success to C. And right, so A is an A, B is an A, and C is right. Now, uh, okay, all our T box. Uh, axioms are in the single form, right? We saw here. So, left hand side is the concept name. So, we can only apply them uh, when we see this name appear next to some video. Right? And, uh, yeah, one more note which I didn't tell. If you look, didn't tell. Right, if you look at the rules, uh, if you look at the conjunction, right? Um, you take an individual, you see the conditions there, and you replace, if, if conditions are satisfied, then you replace it with a new one. And this rule is not applicable anymore, because it wouldn't add anything new here, right? This is true for existential, because if we see existential could apply, apply it, then this 
would prevent us to apply the game. So this rule is after the ball of the ones. This, well, this rule is after the ball ones as well. But, uh, but it's not easy to keep track of A boxes here in the, in the paper. So I'll go do a little trick and go for this way. So we'll apply it several times, but well, two times actually. One and two. And uh, in the first instance, we add C1 and the second instance, if we find it didn't end up with a clash free complete uh, A box. Then we go back and apply it a second time. And this was also the goal only once for every individual and A box. Right? So the rule is tricky because in the course of expanding our A box, we might create new and new edges coming from a single point. So this, this condition could be true again, again, again. So we need to recheck this uh, rule every time we generate, uh, create a new individual. So this means that once we apply one of the uh, single, let's say, rules, just forget about the, the, uh, the reason to make. So, okay, A is a sort of A. By the GCI, simple GCI rule, it's also a sort of basic conjunction. B and this are G and follow us. Right, and this A is done. You can just cross it and don't pay attention to it anymore. Right, it's still used to detect clash potentially. If we somehow figure out that A should be an instance of not A, then we'll find a question that's it. But we don't bother about A in terms of uh, doing any inference on it. So, the same for B, right? So we have A and H and uh, O up F. We're done with E. And for G we have E O O R not C. Right. So Here are the rules. So are there any rules applicable? And if so, to which node and to which expression and which rule? Well, if you figure out the expression, then the rule is obvious. So yeah, let's let's choose something which is not typed yet and see. What can we do with this? Right? Any little goals? Come on, you break. We have five minutes to break. The earlier we finish with this, the earlier we have to oh, Okay. Right. Anybody? Anybody? So this can you help us? <laughs> well, try the conjunction rule for A. Okay, let's try. Right. So what the conjunction rule says, okay, if we have a conjunction in some node, but not all the conjects in it, then replace the A box with adding all the conjects to the A. Right? Okay. We have a big conject there. Conjunction there, and none of the conjunctions actually is in there, so we just add them. Okay, and we're done with this conjunction, right? So 
it's quite easy to see what's what's what is already processed, what is not. But as long as we cross, keep crossing things, we easily can see um, what's what's left, right? What's left? Anybody? Okay, right. We know how to deal with conjunctions. So we'll do it. Yeah, we will not actually do the junction yet. As the uh, usual algorithms do. So in theory, in the algorithm you can apply any rule to any Point. In practice, well, it's better to somehow to define the application of the rules, uh, depending on the kind of a rule and, uh, and on to, to which you are going to apply. And the disjunction rules and the distension rules are bad, but in different ways. The distension rules, which are this one, forces you to create additional nodes in the, in the graph, in the, the A box, which is beautiful size. This junction leads you to choose from, from, from the, to operate a copy of an A box in our case, which greatly increases the size. We want to, want to do this as late as possible, because if you find a very clash, then I couldn't bother expanding it anymore. Right, so I deal with all the conjunctions, right? I'll leave this junction for later. What's next? What's not crossed? What? What? Come on, tell me. What's not cross yet? Yeah? I think we reached the operation of G and H. Which one? Uh, in C, you did something with G and H. In C, no, I've got G. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. we do have G in A and P, right? Well, uh, E in P and. Oh, yeah. E or. Right, G is uh, A and P. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's not crossed, it's just non-existent. Uh, so here we have yes, E and P. Okay, and as it's conjunction, we cross it. We have E here and P here. Right, what else? What's on that? I'm already have E. E? P. Okay, we're going to apply the GCI rule. This 
Festival. So, uh, and we don't want to touch it right now. And this age takes us to the same structure, right? But what's next? Nobody knows. Okay, but right. figure out that names are quite easy to explain. Right? We just look at the T box, get a definition of, 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 of a name, and expand it. So we have B here. Or not. Well, we don't have a, a definition for B, right? So that's simple. We don't need to do anything with it. We just this here to in order to wait for possible patch or in order to check whether it's uh, useful for some of the cool applications. Well, I've got A here, cross an A, and put in here B. Uh, exists our machine, and we're all passing. Right. Uh, again, B could be just cross straight away. Don't care. Um, here we have P and A. P is fine. We don't have any definition of P. Don't worry about it. For A, we have D. Uh, this R G. For all R C. Cross B. Right. What do we have now? All the names, all the characters are gone, all the names which anybody use anything are gone. We're left with the uh, universals, essentials, and disjunctions. And you are the part of me, you believe me, the disjunctions will keep for, for the latest moment. Right, so which rule shall we apply? Essential or universal? Which type of rule? Any, any? Okay. Extension. Right. Let's do the extensions. Okay, let's go here. You have this. You don't have to. Hmm? You don't have to because this is how you will use the power key. You have J here? Yeah. You have J here, right. So this is this is the, the rule for this one is not applicable, right? And we don't have any uh, other way to split it. So we're done with this one. What about here? Do we have a disjunction uh, here? Yes. But we do have an average, right? To an individual which can be So we're done with this one as well. And the only thing is this one, right? We don't have any assets at all. So we have a precondition for the existential rules here. So pretty you know, you can use an element called a text to distinguish it from the static A box. Uh, the ROH here. And label it with a uh, G. Uh, yeah, it's this one. On the cross. Right, and then okay, we have got a new node, new name. How about the definition of G? It's uh, E and P. E and P. Uh, done with P. For E, we have A. Uh, H. Uh, right, and it seems like we're going to repeat ourselves, right? What is C now here, which have NG, and go to A and P, right? We expand it to A and P, then we go to E and P, and then uh, G 
and we've got A and H, then we've got some other stuff, bunch of stuff, and then we, we go to the special thing, right? And now, uh, we're going to continue this way, right? We'll do all the same things in the same way, right? So let's do a couple more things. So for A, we do have the it exists on here and for our C. Right? And here we already see the pattern. Right? We do have yeah, yeah we need it there. So we do have uh, exist RG here but no R successor, right? We're going to create another R successor. Which is why eventually, when we're done with the rest of the capital this point. Create my Y, put G there, and then we're going to repeat the whole thing, right? So we're going to create new nodes, expand, 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 and then figure out that okay, we have to create another node. And it seems like we never stop. Right, so let's let's make a point here and go for it. We'll figure out how to deal with it after. Right, so <coughs> what we have to figure out from this example. Uh, okay, if we start using these rules that we might come to the situation where it never terminates. We we'll create you know, new notes again and again and again. So why is it happening? Well, why did we saw this yesterday? Because yesterday we don't have a cyclic uh, T boxes. And now we do have a cyclic T box. So to, to figure out how it works, just let's look at the very simple ontology. So we've got a single element in the T box, which is an instance of A, and a single arc in the T box, which is an instance of what which says A equals to this RP. So this situation is very similar to what we have here. Let's, let's draw it. No, we have just, uh, just two loops to apply. Okay, we start with a single enables in the middle of A, the name here. Then replace A with its definition. Then, okay, it's existential. We don't have any uh, other ages, so let's create one. Call it X. Uh, let's call it X. And make here. And we just did the situation within two steps to go. Right? The A will replace the base with this RA. And we will do the thing. <coughs> Creating on Y. They want A. Expand the A. And this is going to continue. Right. So, how to prevent this bad situation? Try to do something. Just on <coughs> top of it. But let's let's just block it. So what can we see from here? We see that the nodes are very similar to each other. Right? They are uh, they have the same labels or at least they start with yeah, you know, let's just do one step. The same label one set. A, and then we figure out that something goes wrong. So all the labels are similar. We might not expand them completely, but all the new label repeats the previous one. So let's say okay. But what does it really mean? It means that we can just make a loop at some point. So creating new individuals as we do in the tab because 
we don't really care about reusing the noodles we've got before. But when we see this are in all this creator, you want. But okay, if we instead of creating a new one, if we just have a look. Then we see this right? This node has a name as an RH to a node to itself, right? Which has a name. And we're done. That's a model. We don't need to expand anything else. And this is uh, the idea of underlying blocking. So the blocking says that, <coughs> okay, if we, in such a situation, when we can make a loop, then we don't need to <coughs> uh, expand or better say that this way, right? Like this, right? If we have something which is going to repeat itself again and again, let us go back. And make it cycle. So, if we have uh, some new individual A, well, it's quite wide now, right? Which is freshly introduced, so it's not, no individual from the original A box could be blocked. But newly created individual could be blocked. We take this individual and have a look in our A box. Is there anything similar? Did we already pass this part or not? And we look at this, look at the set of concepts, which are of which our individual chosen individual is an instance. So why is it an instance of A and this are A? Right, so that's an instance of A. And we check are there in our A box any of individual, any individual which have a set of class assertions larger than <coughs> given. So in case of Y, yeah, we do have an individual X which have the same set of assertions. In case of Z, the same X have even larger set of assertions. And the thing is that uh, this another individual should be older than Kai. So it should be created before uh, the one that we uh, And if this is the case, then we can just say, okay, we don't need to expand this current one. We just uh, reuse the one that we have. And in this case, we say that the old individual will be this uh, blocks A and say that A is blocked. Right, so and for blocked individuals we don't do any expansion at all. Because we've already done it for the older one. Or we can do that. And we know that if we do that there it's it will be absolutely similar. So all the rules are changed in a way that they only apply to non-blocked nodes. Right, so uh, the first three rules are here and they are straight away, the expansion straight away. And uh, well, the, the last two are here and the universal rule is again the straightforward uh, Update from the previous version, and the desired rule now is the rule for a concept name on the left hand side. So yeah, let's, let's go to it probably. <coughs> Let me if I have a GCR in our tables and a node in the name box which is not blocked, and uh, okay, there are two cases now. If C is a concept name and uh, Class assertion A instance of C is in the A box, but A instance of D not in the A box, then let's just add it. And if C is not a concept name, then we just make a, a, a set way of adding this junction to the node. Again, if the node is not blocked, 
if you fit on this block, then it's fine. We already added this junction with a uh, blocker node and uh, do all the rest expansion there. But uh, if not, if it's non blocked and there is no decide there yet, then we just add it. Okay. Is it fine? Is it, is it clear? Questions? No questions. Okay, right. Let's, 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 let's see how it works. Let's do our small example, or not the big one. This one. <coughs> Right. How are we doing it with respect to the algorithm? <coughs> All we need is okay. It wasn't price, but anyway. Right. Decide all this, right? <coughs> uh, we have A plus B sub A, and A is a constant name, so A is an uh, empty individual from the ontology, so it, it couldn't be blocked. Then we have to create an cartridge. Now, this is a rule. Okay. Uh, a, a, a is not blocked. Well, let's not figure it out. Is it blocked or not? Right, we're fine with it. 
So now we've got an algorithm which does the thing, right? So and this is uh, standard programming. Uh, let's let us have uh, an ontology, I'll say ontology, in a uh, negative normal form. Then uh, the top algorithm, as we have it in, in this last version, always terminates and is applied to all. Then, uh, if uh, the rules generate a complete and clash variable, it's then always consistent. Uh, this is called uh, Soundness, right? We don't apply. If we say that something is uh, consistent, then it is consistent. And the uh, third claim is the other way around, the completeness. If ontology is consistent, then we generate at some point a complete and clash free box. This means that we give all the answers, right? If something is consistent, then we come to this answer and we give it. We didn't lose any answers. Well, these three, three things to mention some of the completeness make a number of decision procedures. Right. Okay, let's go back to our things. Dot tests. We did three of them. Let's take, I don't know, some other probably one with two to ten annotations and try to use table algorithm to prove its assumption. Right? Which one? Anything? Any any wish? Which one to choose? Second. Okay, no. Uh, yeah. Then module six will be the first one. You already did it. Okay, six. Right. So okay, we want to check whether empty ontology. Right, we don't have any T box and A box. Uh, satisfies this assumption. Right. What shall we do? How do we? How only only can do uh, consistency checking of the ontology, right? So how can we reduce the task? Of Checking the assumption to the uh, checking the consistency. Mm -hmm. How do we do this? Try to remember. It was half an hour ago. We should check it for interpretation. No, no, no. That's, that's by definition, but we now use using double algorithm, right? What reason it asks at the beginning of the talk, and we show a theory which says how to reuse any reason it asks to check in the consistency of the methodology. Right? So which ontology we have to check? How to build an ontology which would corresponds which consistency would, would correspond to subsumption? Where was it? That's not that simple. Whether this assumption holds on. Right? And we're going to do it. We're going to do it using our tab algorithm. But the problem is the tab algorithm works only for to check the consistency of an ontology. Right? We need to somehow reduce this task to checking the assumption of 
to concepts to check the consistency of the ontology. Right? How we do this? What the theory at the beginning of uh, the day? That all these tasks, all the system tasks are proven, right? And we know a way how they correlate to each other. Check the records.
uh, and on the right, issues, just And say that a and y are 
And okay, you don't have any definition. We have an MGT box, no definition for B. So we're down here, no definition for not A. We're down there. And that's it. So here we have a complete and clash free A box. So going back to back to here. We said that this this doesn't hold, right? Our new ontology with a MCT box and not too complex A box is consistent. Which means if we go back and look at the theorem. Which means that this subsumption doesn't hold. So, uh, 
go through them. In order to do really practical reasoning, we need to use the optimizations. Because uh, well, we know a few tunnel reasons right now which are very fast and very efficient. And so what again what what what's what's so good about Tableau? So one of the thing is that they really have plenty of ways to optimize it. Meditations can concern more or less every every aspect of the algorithm. It can concern pre-processing stage when you just simplify things in easy way, in smart way, in very smart way. It concerns the application of rules, how to choose strategy to apply them, what to do, how to properly explore their disjunctions, how to do things in uh, in every stage, how, how to save us from redoing experiments in the Lack of opportunities to um, to optimize. And um, there have been many cases, many is in quotes because, um, again, the algorithm itself is exponential. So, which means that it all is possible for every algorithm, for every implementation, however optimized it is, of this type of algorithm. It's possible to construct an example of which behaves very bad. But for the general case, for the real life ontologies that people did, for the real life uh, D boxes and A boxes, it's possible to catch some patterns for which you can uh, learn something, some heuristics. And in common case, it will work very, very nice, very fast. So this is why actually the whole, I'd say the whole, um, Research area exists because there was a need to reason about large knowledge bases, large ontologies in, in a very fast way, and they need uh, some complete procedures. So they need to not miss any result and not give uh, wrong results. And uh, so, simple syntactic uh, approaches that we used ages ago were incomplete, so they didn't give you all the results. They usually give you some, it's not hard to give you some procedure for this. But, uh, so you always would get correct results, but not, not all of them. And having uh, formally proved procedures that works fast on a real life application is really crucial, and uh, a few optimizations will make the, the whole area rise up. And so, yeah, all, all the optimizations are implemented in various reasons got about this, this for uh, a few tabular reasons around which are highly optimized. Right, and we are going to discuss some of them. Right, uh, let's start from absorption. The problem with GCI, right? If you have um, a T box which contain a number of GCIs of without a name on the left hand side, so it's really something complex on the left hand side, then we're going to add for every individual in our A box, we're going to add a disjunction, right? For every box, which is really, really bad. So, uh, yeah, it doesn't really matter. Well, I assume we still have a single A box, right? With the remembering the brushing points and doing the like checking in case of clash. So, we have a single A box, right? This, this doesn't apply here because no, no left hand sides are constant names. So, for every uh, on block A, we do we add a disjunction if it wasn't there. So for every A, so it's size of A box, right? 
roughly speaking, because there are not too many block nodes there. Uh, for every uh, axiom which is n, right, we have so have already n times size of n box disjunctions. And which disjunction is a direction point. So we need to, to keep this track thing, go down at some point we found the clash, go back and then redo stuff again again. It's it's very nice, it's very efficient. So yeah, we have too many options to choose from and too too, too many things to explore to, to really do it. I think it's fine. Right, so but if you look at the real life uh, topologies, you'll say that in the vast majority of cases, the GCIs are in the form such as uh, you have a name conjuncted with something else. And this implies some, some, some other complex expression. Right? So on the left hand side, you don't have arbitrary thing. Right? But it's usually a conjunction of, of elements. One of them is a uh, domain class. And the idea is to, to use uh, uh, the properties of the subsumption relation and to localize uh, this GCI's the name is the report uh, on the left hand side. So out of the elements of conjunction here, we choose a uh, we choose a name and keep it on the left hand side of And this is equivalent to move the rest to the uh, right hand side negated and use join to C. So right. if if the axiom looks like a uh, human who owns a pet, some pet is uh, something that you pet owner, for example. Right? Uh, it transforms it into GCI, and we need to have a disjunction everywhere, but if we can transform it into the human, is uh, either not a pet, or either it doesn't own a pet, right? Or it's, it's a pet owner or whatever it is. Uh, and these two things are equivalent, right? Because uh, what does this thing say? This thing says if Roughly speaking, okay, if you have a node, if you have an individual which you have A and you have X, then you have to add C here. And this thing have says, okay, if you have A, then either you don't have X, and then you then you don't care, right? Or you have X. And in this case you have to add C. It's the same trick we did with GCI in general, right? So uh, it's exactly this transformation we did here. Right, so instead of having C implies D, we have top implies uh, not C or D. So it's exactly the same trick, but we do it in a more refined way. Right, so what, what does what it does give us? Okay, some of the actions now transformed into the uh, Simple ones where constant name on the left hand side. So they don't introduce the junction everywhere. They introduce the junction only in case we see this A in I somewhere. And this significantly reduces the number of search space. Again, except in most, uh, in the real ontologies, there are some GCI, but most of them are in this form. So, those you said we have the better and we use this transformation to do the thing. So if there is no GCI in our T box of this form, then okay we didn't do anything and we couldn't we, we didn't do worse than before. Right? We have the same complexity. But if something uh, if, if single axiom is available, right, we get rid of uh, one disjunction per individual, which is not an AI, which usually is a lot. And uh, again, in the best case, everything would be localized, so no, no disjunctions would be applied at all. 
Right. Any questions for this? Okay. Right. Right. Good job. So we'll keep uh, yeah, we now get rid of the set of A boxes, right? We're not keep a single A box and remember that the choices of non metric choices will be made for the disjunction. And then we just uh, if we find the clash, we go back to the last non deterministic choice and then try another one. So we couldn't if we don't jumping because uh, we might just miss uh, opportunity. But what if we have, for example, this crazy expression, right? We have what we have here is we have single existential, right? It is R A and B. We have a long, long, long disjunction, uh, well, several disjunctions, and then we have uh, for all R not A, right? So how it works? We start from a single individual, then make a branching decision uh, on the first disjunction, for example, right? Assume I get C1 here. Then we need to decide what to do with the second disjunction, and we look at it. Let's set C2, and so on. Let's set C and here, right? And if, if this way, and we remember all level what we did with A. So here was the direction for the first disjunction, here was the direction for the second disjunction, here was the direction uh, on the last disjunction. Right. But remember our choice. And if something goes wrong here, if you found a clash here, we go back and choose another alternative, right? So we say, okay, yeah, choice of CM was wrong in this disjunction. So this means it's not CM, it's DM. And explore this. And if this is bad, then this, this choice was wrong, right? We need to project from here and go all this way. So we have two to the N options to explore. That's really a lot. But then, when we go to this point, right, we create uh, an average, expanding this existential. And, uh, okay, this existential has a certain label A and B. Uh, then we expand conjunction, so it's A and B. And then we propagate universal from, from, from this X and uh, put a not A in there, right? And here we have a relation. Then A and not A. And then, okay, yeah, things go like I said before. Go back to check. Remember that the last non deterministic choice was done here. So go to check, make another one. Put here not C and D in. But nothing changed, right? We still have the same existential here. We still have the same label here. And we put them in the label and go to clash again. And it's easy to see that this clash doesn't really depend on any of these our non deterministic choices made. So how how many well, well we're going to explore all of them and in, in the very end we will find the clash. So this uh, Apox isn't consistent, but in order to figure it out using our main approach, we need to explore this to the end alternative. So the idea of the Japanese, uh, when we found the clash, well, when we do the branching, right, we create a dependency set. Um, and every, every change of the A box now carries a dependency on, on which uh, branching point it, it depends. Like this C1 would have a dependency off of the first disjunction. This is n minus one addition to the label. We carry dependency of the n minus one disjunction expansion. This would carry dependency of the f uh, disjunction expansion. But when we get this a and b here, it goes because of this existential rule, right? And there is no branching. It doesn't depend on any of the previous branching points, right? It doesn't depend on any decision we made 
during this uh, expansion of the junctions. So this depends to set the empty. And so do this one. And so do this, this A and B because it comes without any dependencies. Never found a clash in general. We see what uh, what dependency set carries A and not A, which are involved in the clash. And uh, we take the latest decision made in, in this case and just jumps back to this particular branching decision point, skipping the rest, because we know that whichever choices we make there, our clash is independent. It will stay there for every possible combination of the choices. So branch to the last to the last uh, uh, decision made and check it. In this particular case, we can skip all, all possible choices because this clash is independent of all of them. So go straight to the original A box and say, okay, whichever choices we made, you know, it's found in these disjunctions. Uh, it doesn't really matter. We always have a clash. So this is how the example works. And uh, right, so uh, what else? What else? Well, I'll see the logic extends proposition logic, right? We have all the conjunctions, operations similar to conjunction, injunction, and negation. Uh, so it is just like the blue proposition logic. And uh, the consistency checking includes the checking of the stability of a concept. It has some more things which we just just had some other um, positions. But all the optimizations that develop for self checking, for stability checking in the Boolean position with all applied here. So you can just look at the any optimization paper made for the sensibility checking and run the algorithms in the them. And they will work really well again because uh, because sensibility part of the description logics are simpler than the one in the in the uh, proposition logics because we have more options to uh, to describe things. Right. We have rich language, we don't need to pack ourselves into this lower level things. We use less complex uh, structures, it works so very quickly, so it works better for us. So, summing up, uh, tunnel algorithms are quite straightforward, and straightforward implementation is uh, very efficient, but they can be optimized in many, many ways. In, in different stages of, of the algorithm of, of, of a tool, let's say, right? From, from very beginning, from optimizing the structure of the ontology down to very detailed optimization of data structures and all that. So, and uh, they can really significantly enhance the performance of the algorithm. Uh, but, okay, the, the, the implementer should be care about they have two several optimizations, right? So do they interact with each other? Right? If so, how do they interact? Did one of the heuristics degrade the performance of the other one, or did one of the heuristics do things such that there is no precondition for another one, so we can one one just subsumes another one? And so which combinations to choose for which cases, right? Some Heuristics works perfectly well for pure T boxes, not A boxes. Some works great in another case, like simple uh, T box, huge A box. How to tune the set of optimizations for your project? Yeah, that's a huge amount of questions. And one of the main questions is taking all this into account is the optimized algorithm still correct? Do you still have proper answers in all the cases? Uh, and this is a question. Uh, so, if you if you want to write the implementation uh, 
incorporate one into the other. There's usually need to uh, prove the correctness. Right. So, what half an hour? I think there's enough to go to the other one. Oh, good. This is a good try, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll probably wouldn't have time to finish it, <laughs> but uh, this is how. Try to do something like this. Right. So, the reason with uh, ILC is what's most the problem, right? Why do you use the What is the Why do you start thinking about it at all? The uh, reason with ILC is in charge. Right? So, for every algorithm, for every power optimized visit, it's possible to find a task problem for which it will work exponentially slow. Right? Even if it's not naive implementation with a set of A boxes, but a single A box here, uh, checking and jumping, whatever it is, it's still, uh, it's still uh, slow in general, in the worst case. So, and the thing is, okay, right, um, can we probably go on to speed up a bit, right? Can we probably give up some pictures? This might allow us to, to do something more efficient than what we have in the exponential size. And actually, yes, we can. So let's, let's have a look how, how, how we are going to do it. In the very beginning of the T boxes. Um, uh, one of the main reasoning algorithm, let's say, was a uh, structural subsumption algorithm, which uses a structure for a constant expression and hierarchy, constant hierarchy, in order to figure out which subsumption could be uh, possible using just synthetic. Uh, so if we have a T box like this, right? A is equivalent to C and exists D, B is equivalent to C prime and exists D prime, and C is a sub uh, C prime subsumes C and D prime subsumes D. Right? What does it mean, roughly speaking? So Very few uh, 
uh, can only do very few inferences to the same <laughs> Right, so this assumption is good. This is bad. We want to precise answers. But this sort of things could be adjusted to, to make a complete thing uh, for the coaches. Right, so again, this matrix is the same, and the other is sub logical. Uh, C, which doesn't contain negation at all, doesn't contain uh, universals at all, so we only have uh, concept names, it has top, no bottom, so no negation is no bottom, uh, adjunctions, subjects, and uh, essential restrictions. And concept inclusion axioms, again, complex concept of any SI. Right, so we don't have universals, we don't have relations, why? And of course, I told us yesterday that uh, it's not too bad, we still can't express many things. So why is it a real case? Uh, right, some technical details. So if you have a syntactic sub-expression of a concept which is on the left-hand side of any of an axiom in the tables. We'll call this uh, this sub-expression because uh, we'll set that this sub-expression occurs negatively to tables. And again, the primary sub-expression of the right hand side of some axiom it occurs positively to the We just do negative. Right, and again, what are the reasoning problems? Let's, let's go back. Uh, we don't have bottom, right? And we don't have negation, so there is no possibility to have a clash. So we couldn't, there is no need to check for consistency. Every, every T box is consistent. Right? We don't, no clash, so no unsatisfiable classes. Right? Every class is satisfied. Uh, we do have only T box here. No arrows, so no instance checking possible. The only thing left is just subsumption, right? Out of our classical reasoning classes. So the algorithm actually solves the problem to find all the subsumers, all the main subsumers, not, not all the main subsumers. Yeah. All the subs okay, let's, let's put it this way. All the main subsumers for some uh, Concept A, CC, which is not an expression uh, name. So take an expression and give it to the algorithm and then get back a set of some concept names, which is uh, which all are its tumors. Well, how the algorithm works? It works with an unknown set of facts. You know about it. And I will tell you what the facts are in a minute. So it starts with some initial set of facts, which depends on the concept of uh, the task right? of which subsume is looking for. And then it drive, drives the facts uh, using the inference rules, like, like the table rules, but different ones, and the existing facts. So it looks at the facts, see if it combines, can combine them in a way to get something new and then put a new fact into the set of all facts. If uh, nothing can be derived, then all stops. Right, and the rest is the presentation of all the works in ELK, which matters a lot of them, of course. Uh, but I'm, I'm speaking about very simple language, just for the ELK. Right, so facts. What are the facts? Uh, Three different benefits. Uh, Init C means uh, that the algorithm is going to derive all the subtreners uh, of C, whether C is expression or C is a main uh, concept. Well, it's usually the only initial fact. So if, if you want to check all the subtreners of a given class, you just start our reasoning with a single unit uh, fact in our fact. 
Right. It might be substantial between two uh, concept expressions. And it's different from the t box axiom. It might be different from t box axiom. So they see some different things. t box is lives aside from this effects. But it might be the The interesting thing is that all these assumptions that affects are actually entailed by, by our t box. So we prove that t box is uh, entails this assumption. Right, and the third type of fact is this uh, relation thing, C and D are related by R, which is a uh, semantic property equivalent to C by this box, this RD. So it's the point slides, uh, this is the point there. Uh, but uh, it's equivalent to, to, to this implication, but it's used different, in a different way with the, in the inference rules. So we keep it in, in a separate form. Right, and the rules. The, there are seven rules for, the, for this fragment, for the EL fragment in there. So how do we process in it? There are two rules to process in If we see in C here, we start from a tautology. Right, C is a subclass of C. Sub -sub C sub C of C. That's, that's always true for every class. And uh, another thing works not always, but only if total occurs negatively in GT. Questions? Questions? Right. So if, if top occurs negatively in T means uh, we have an absolute total implies something in our two rows. Sure. Right, in this case, uh, we if we need C is one power facts in our total in our fact base, we add to fact base uh, C uh, is a class of top. This is very well, is anybody familiar with notation or Okay, right. The, the, the rule implication is as follows. The thing over the line is a premise. So if all the facts in the I in the line go twice. And, and this is a side condition. So if this contains an our power base and this holds, then the rule applies and everything which is below the line adds to our power base. So if we have an infinite C, and of course it's the same thing as so we don't introduce any new stuff. If C implies C is already in a fact base, we don't find this rule again. So, okay. I mean, it's C and uh, here we see there. And, uh, right. And then, uh, single rule which uses uh, our tables. So if we have a fact that C implies D, right. and we know from a T-box that D implies D, here C D and D can all be complex concept expressions. Then we add to our fact base a fact that C implies D. So it's just the transitivity of a substantial relation. But this is the only thing that relates to the original T-box. And more for conjunction expectations. Right. So, again, conjunction is simple, right? And just based on the fact that if I have two implications, we can combine them in two simple implications with conjunction. And the other one. So, in one direction it's simple. If I have something complex, we can always split two simple things. And it just it, it, it goes, happens every time. So if we have now an aggregate this location, then we can split it into two. Right, and uh, the other way around, we do only if a conjunction we are going to have. 
it is, and it's a red curse in the, the T-box. So, the similar thing happens for extensions. But it's slightly more complicated. If we uh, have an implication on the right hand side, then we need to find all the superclusters to be, and we keep track of this existential in this version. And then, uh, interaction of the existential, if we have such a thing, and we have the super property or super concept of C, and we know that this expression is occurs to the left hand side of an axon, and we also going to use this. So, what's, what can we see from this? Right? We have sort of pattern, right? Having an elimination rule. If something complex is in our fact base, then we split it into simple pieces and add them independently to the fact base. But if you want to go to other direction, do it only if it might somehow affect the reason. If there is something on the left hand side of the application which can propagate it further out. Right. So we don't create this planning, we don't merge things together mindlessly. Right? We do this on purpose. We do this only in the case it can somehow add up add us to the universe. It's a bit complicated, but Think of it, it's it's uh, both. And I think uh, I'll just go through, through the example uh, to show how it works. Right, so what we have to remember is So we have a T-box, we have actually four axioms, because this equivalence axiom is split into two implications. B implies A and it exists at E, and it exists at E implies, and, and A implies B. Right, so I want to find all the tumors of the concept of A. So we start with a need A. Right. So no more facts. Just this one. Uh, okay. What do we have? What do we know about A? We can derive that A implies A. And uh, that's it. So it doesn't occur anywhere on the left hand side, right? We don't, we don't have our class rule, so we can't do anything. Okay, A implies A. T box combination probably. Yeah, you know that this axiom here. So we can add A implies this uh, Thank you. 
f and a implies that this is rd and we have conjunction of the two on the right hand side of, of some of the rows in the continuous. So that's 10, let's introduce this conjunction. A implies A and exists uh, D, which comes from 8 and 1, while the conjunction is rational. And again, okay, just just use this rule. This this stacks on here in the right other direction. Here. We will try to find the point of A equals B. Which is again goes to all the But we're not finished here because there are more, more things to apply. But still, uh, I think I have to stop the time. Uh, and the space of the Right, to sum up a little bit. This consequence based algorithm, like this, uh, provides tractable reasoning for AL. It's the complexity is called number with respect to the size of the topology. Is implemented in, in various reasoning. Reasoners out of the recent ones, Elk is well known and very shows very well in commons on the huge ontologies. And uh, this approach can be extended to more specific logics. And well, again, you get complicated, you get somehow just better complex things, but it still shows quite high performance. And uh, and in case of tab algorithms, it allows to apply different strategies, how to choose to, to combine, which way to go, and different organizations. It's quite a lot of it, because he's one of the methods of it now, and that was well. Uh, right, I think I'll skip the examples, because we don't have time to wait. Uh, probably one, for five minutes. Right, this is the real life example. And I'll go to the LP. I've got a visitor in, in Manchester who tries to use description logics to describe some social uh, social things and their relations between others. So she tried to describe the ontology of uh, uh, homeless people. Right. And okay, the ontology is like this, right? So say so, okay, we have persons, we have homes, and okay, let's describe home as a person, right? Well, it's a person, so the first person, and uh, let's say it's, it's defined as something who not doesn't live in any home, right? Which says. Uh, Okay, so homeless person is equivalent to not exist some home in which it is. And we also have in the ontology this GCR. So if something lives in something, then it's a person. So this is a standard strange loop text term number three. Uh, shows that, uh, says actually that the domain of this game is a person. It's a standard way in, um, in the script logics now to say that um, if we have a lives in edge within two nodes, then at the beginning of this uh, lives in edge it would be a class person. Right, quite a lot, right? quite two, right? three, three axioms, everything seems fine, everything seems same. So, any, any internals you can find here? Some unusual? Actually, this, if you 
put the storyline and publish it and press the classify button. You think that you will see that it entails that the first is equal to the top. Okay. Uh, so I'm not going to tell you how it is actually. Yeah. I'm running out of time. So it's, it's your homework. <laughs> You've got an algorithm for the L. If, if you don't have it, I've uh, got a presentation here. So just try to figure out uh, how out of these three nice and same axioms it's possible to prove that the person is done. You can use tab algorithm, it's fine, but I think the AL algorithm suits better for this. Because it's it's it, 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 oh no. No. Mm -hmm. Not bad. Sorry. There is negation there. Just tab algorithm then. Okay. That's still it's good. Right? So that's it. I would like to thank uh, all of my colleagues and ex-colleagues to the chamber and Thomas Schneider for the uh, slides from the first part of the talk. But and yeah, if you have any questions, if you want to have slides. And any questions on this topic, I'll discuss the video. Thank you.